Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to The Walk. Today is Sunday, August 8th. I apologize for being kind of late. Um, I just got slow moving this morning, so slept in and all that. Anyway, um, the last few days we've been talking about spiritual gifts. Um, we read Romans 12, where we saw that list of spiritual gifts. Then we went to um, 1 Corinthians 12, that gave us another list. And then we went to 1 Corinthians 14, where it kind of compared the difference between praying in tongues and prophecy. We're gonna circle back to that at the end of today's message and touch on that again. But I wanted to really examine what it means to be praying in the spirit. So that's what we're talking about mostly today. So before we jump into the message, let's pray and then we'll get right into it. God, I thank you that you give us these gifts so that we can pursue our relationship with you more effectively, that you do that just because you want that close, intimate, personal relationship with us so much that it's that you made this way for us to have this fellowship with you. You sent Jesus to die on the cross. He rose from the dead conquering that sin. And on top of all that, you still bestow upon us all these gifts so that we can serve you and help expand your kingdom. God, you know us way better than we will ever know ourselves. You know exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. And we thank you that you provide just in time. Lord, as we go through our week, help us to be bold and confident in serving you through our gifts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're starting off today. We're going to be bouncing around the Bible, oh, uh, uh, Bible a lot. Um, I believe we're mostly in the New Testament. I don't think I have anything in the Old Testament, but we are really going to be examining what it means to be praying in the Spirit. Because you can pray and the words are coming from your brain, and you can also pray and have the words coming straight from the Holy Spirit. And there is a very big difference between the two. When we pray, we stumble over our words, it's not eloquent. Um, and we're trying to think of what we need to pray for next. Sometimes there's pauses as we process our thoughts. When the Holy Spirit takes over and prays through us, all of that is removed. It is fluid, it is fluent, it's exactly what he wants us to pray for. It is exactly what needs to be prayed for. And a lot of times when it's happening in tongues, we walk away having no idea what we just prayed, but we know it was important because it was led by the Holy Spirit. And we submit to that because he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the one that's on his throne. So today we're starting off in Romans 8, 26, and this is what it says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So the Spirit is there because we have weakness. The Spirit is there because we have sin in our lives. The Spirit is there because we have these temptations. The Spirit is there because we can run out of our own strength but we can't run out of the strength that comes from God because it's a steady supply. The spirit is there because we don't have enough grace on our own, but we get that steady supply of grace from God. That's why the spirit is there to make up for the fact that we have shortcomings. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. I don't know about you, but I have had times in my life where I have been so emotional over something that has happened and I'm trying to pray about it and all I can do is go, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, or just kind of groan and make weird noises that the words just won't come because I'm so, um, so upset about whatever's happening or so excited that I can't even put the words together. It, it's just, it comes out as groans. And that's when the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. And those wordless prayers become words as they hit God the Father's ears. And he hears them and he responds to them. Verse 27, and when he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Okay, there's a lot there. God searches your heart. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what you really want. He knows that you're pursuing that relationship with him. And he knows the mind of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so those two things come together. And the Holy Spirit intercedes 
on those prayers, when those prayers are just groans and you can't come out with the words and you can't get anything intelligible out that you can even understand, the Holy Spirit is taking over those prayers and he is carrying them straight to God the Father because that's God's will. He wants us to always be able to communicate with him. And when our humanity gets in the way because we're so weak, the Holy Spirit takes over and that communication continues. That's why praying in the Spirit is so valuable. It's such a dynamic part of your relationship with Christ. And if you've not gotten to that level in your prayer life, shoot me a message. I will be glad to help you get to that point in your prayer life because once you get there, it's like if you knew what you had available to you, if you really knew what you had available to you when you start to pray in the Spirit, you would pursue that with every ounce of energy you have. It, it's just, it's, it's amazing. As we continue on getting more information about this idea of praying in the spirit, we're going to Ephesians 6.18. Now, if you look at the paragraph right before it, that's the armor of God. And the armor of God is the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the feet fitted with the gospel, the helmet of salvation. Um, all those things are coming together from the Holy Spirit. He provides that suit of armor. And this is what it says in verse 18, immediately following that. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. We are told in the Bible to pray in the Spirit. If we're not praying in the Spirit, we're not getting to that level that we need to get to to really build that intimacy with God and be his little girl or little boy crawling into his lap and crying on his shoulder. You're not going to get there without praying in the spirit. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. When you get to the point where you are praying in the spirit and those things are happening in your prayer closet, it is the best time in your day. It's the time of day where you look forward to the most because there is such an open communication going back and forth between you and God. And that's why this praying in the spirit circles right back to that idea of prophecy because when you pray in the spirit, that channel of communication is completely open and God's gonna start talking to you. You're gonna start hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. You're gonna be getting some direction. You may be getting some prophecy. You may be told to pray for somebody that you don't even know. It just completely opens up the ways that you can serve God and use your spiritual gifts. As we continue on, we're going to Jude and Jude is a book that's only one chapter. So we're starting in verse 17 and it says, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. So this is what Jesus said to the apostles. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. Definitely can see plenty of that in our world, right? <coughs> Excuse me. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, but do not have the spirit. So when the people, uh, when you are around other believers and they are not at that level where they're praying in the spirit, they're not understanding. They don't get it. It's a little intimidating to them because it's kind of different. They're not sure about it. And sometimes that will cause division. They will say, you shouldn't be speaking in the tongues. There's a lot of people that say the tongues um, stopped when the apostles were gone. And that's not at all true. The tongues have continued to go and praying in the spirit is continuing to happen. It happens to me on a daily basis. So strive for that, reach for that, and just let yourself make groanings and unintelligible sounds and let that Holy Spirit take over those prayers. Verse 20 of Jude. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. So he's saying, despite the fact that these people are scoffing at you, put that out of your mind, build yourselves up in your faith, build yourself up in praying in the Holy Spirit. You're building yourself up in those two things. And you're, then through that, you're able to keep in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to take you home to heaven. 
So you're serving him and you're glorifying him with your life as you're praying in the spirit. Verse 22, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So basically what it's saying is he's saying, even though those scoffers are in your face and yeah, they make you feel bad and yeah, they're causing division, still show them mercy, show them that love that Keep in mind that they're on that spiritual milk. They didn't get to the steak and potatoes yet. So be there to mentor them. Be there to answer questions when they have them because who knows when that's going to happen. And you want to keep that open communication with that person so that you can help them on their path for following Christ. In Galatians 5, 13 through 17, it says this, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And that takes the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's very hard to put your pride to the side. Sometimes it's very hard to put what you want to the side and really think about what a Christian brother or sister or even an unbeliever needs and be there to serve them and show them that love of Jesus Christ. Verse 14 For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So we are called to love the people around us and show them God's mercy, show them God's love, his grace, his peace, his joy, all those things that are fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23, which is going to be happening later in this chapter. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit. I'm going to stop right there. That's not even the verse that inspired the walk, but it could have been. We are told to walk by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that's what walking the walk means. You are living in a a status where you're keeping those God goggles on and you are following what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. So I'm going to back up. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. When you walk by the Spirit, that weakness is overcome that we talked about in Romans 8 at the beginning of this message. That's what being in the Spirit is all about. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So you've got this constant battle. I think of the cartoons where they had the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder. Your flesh is the devil. Your flesh is the one that's trying to tell you to do things that don't glorify God. But the spirit is telling you to do things that do glorify God. And you've got to make a choice because that conflict is constantly going on in us. The spirit is there to help you overcome that conflict. Um, For the flesh desires what is contrary to contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. You have to remember that you belong to God and you are God's representative as you're going through your day. Are you going to get it right every time? Absolutely not. We all mess up. But when we are following God, we're going to get it right more often than not. And People are watching you. They know that you're a believer. They're, they want to see how you conduct yourself, and they're looking for that example. Yeah, they're going to see some things that are off, but they're still there. Um, they, they're still there. They're getting that witness. They're getting that silent witness, and they're watching you change as your relationship with Christ develops. So as we're talking about praying in the Spirit and what it means to pray in the Spirit, you have to kind of backtrack. How did all of this start? And that, of course, takes us to Acts 2, where Pentecost happens. So if you flip over to Acts 2, this is what it says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So there's a whole bunch of believers that followed Jesus. They're all in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. (coughs) Okay, so imagine that you're sitting there, you're in this room, this violent wind comes. If you've ever lived through a hurricane, you know what that's like. This was not something that they made up in their heads. This was a violent wind. They wouldn't have used that word violent unless it was really to stress the fact that you couldn't miss it. It was there. 
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on top of each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So they visually saw these tongues of fire resting upon themselves and they're looking around and all of them start speaking in different foreign tongues. Verse five, now they were staying in Jerusalem. There were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So you've got all these people from all these other nations, languages right away. They're speaking in tongues. I'm thinking about the languages. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. So not only did the people in the room experience this, the people that were outside of the room are noticing that something has happened and they're even hearing their own languages being spoken. Verse seven, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, at Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phydria and Pamphyla, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arab, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Now, if you continue reading in this chapter, you're going to see that um, I believe it's Peter, he gets up and he tells them the entire plan of the redemption and thousands and thousands of people come to believe in Jesus Christ as a result of it. This is a miracle that happened and unbelievers witnessed it too. Don't think that it was just this room of believers because thousands of people were impacted by this before Peter even started to stand up and tell them about God's plan of redemption. As we continue on, we're moving to Revelations 4.2. And keep in mind, in Revelations 4.2, we're talking about those end times. We're talking about the prophecy that John was given on that island of Patmos. Uh, of Patmos and this is the very last book in the Bible. And watch what it says. At once, I was in the Spirit. John wrote this book. John was in the Spirit. That's an example we can follow. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. What I really want to stress there is that he was in the spirit. When you are in the spirit, those visions, those dreams, that still small voice of the Holy Spirit is whispering in your ears and it's giving you that guidance. It's giving you that wisdom. I had an experience yesterday. Um, I've been I've been struggling a lot. I have um, allergies, really bad allergies, and it causes asthma. And my asthma has had flared up. So yesterday morning, I'm praying. I'm praying for relief for this asthma. And I, this girl that I had been in the hospital with that also had asthma came to my mind, and I started praying for her. And I happened to look at the clock as I was praying for her. And a few hours later, I get on Facebook, and she and I are Facebook friends, and I discover that she had passed away from an asthma attack just as I was praying for her. And I didn't even know what the call was at the time. All I knew was that I needed to pray for her in that moment. And she doesn't, I mean, she probably didn't know it until she got to heaven, but I was able to pray her home. I was able to be there with her kind of in a spiritual way when I didn't know that I should have been there with her physically. And that's the kind of thing that the Holy Spirit does. He puts somebody on your mind with like this pressing um, commitment to pray for them and you don't understand why, but you give into it because you know what comes from the Holy Spirit and you know that the Holy Spirit fulfills that weakness that your human body has. The things that you don't understand, things that you're not completely seeing. So as we move from praying in the Spirit I want you to keep in mind that with prophecy and visions and dreams and hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, you are still in the spirit. It's just not necessarily tongues. Now it's something that you're understanding and you can respond to. So I'm back in 1 Corinthians 14, which is what we talked about on Friday. And we read verses one through 13. We talked about that difference between tongues and prophecy. I'm not going to go back through that because you can watch the video from Friday and get all of that. But we stopped on verse 13 
And this is why um, I really wanted to, to get to the end of this so that I can really stress to you that both things are valuable, yes. However, with prophecy, dreams, visions, hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, you are getting something that your brain can process and you can therefore act upon. With tongues, you don't know what you're praying. The people in the room with you don't know what you're praying. It cannot be acted upon, but it's still from the Holy Spirit. They are both valuable, but that prophecy, visions, dreams, hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit takes it to that next level because then you can now step out in obedience and answer some kind of a call that the Holy Spirit is putting on you. So 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13 says, for this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So you want to pray that you can understand that tongue so that you can step out in that obedience and serve. For if I pray in a tongue, my mind, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. When you are praying in tongues, you don't know what you're saying. You're just letting it go. You're letting the Holy Spirit carry those prayers. Very, very valuable. But... You cannot act upon what you just prayed. You cannot act upon anything that just came out of your mouth because you don't understand what just came out of your mouth unless you get that interpretation. And that's when it becomes moves from tongues to prophecy, visions, dreams, hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. The two of them come in together in conjunction. That praying in the spirit starts off with a lack of understanding because it's tongues. And then that interpretation piece comes in and it can carry all the way through to obedience and something that you have been called to do. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. Verse 18, I thank God that I speak tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, why does he say that? Why does Paul say that? Because when he can speak intelligible words, the people can respond in obedience. They can learn from it. Those tongues are still valuable, absolutely. Let those tongues go, give into that, and let the Holy Spirit take over those prayers. But also remember that when it carries over into visions, dreams, prophecy, and the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, you've taken it, taken it to a much deeper level. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children in regard to evil, be, in, be infants, but in your thinking, be in adults. In the law, it is written, with other tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Sometimes even when you have this demonstration of God's miracle happening right in front of you, people still don't respond. That is not on you. Your job is to tell others about Jesus Christ. And then it's between that individual and the Holy Spirit to work out what will happen next. Remember, the Holy Spirit is not gonna remove that person's free will. It's their decision. Your job was to tell them. Verse 22, tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. It's a miracle that unbelievers are seeing that. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Prophecy brings instruction. And that's where that, that deeper level hits. And that's why it's for the believers. The unbelievers can't receive that instruction yet because they've not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ yet. That's why the two work so well together. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? <coughs> but if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. So imagine this, you have this unbeliever coming into church 
They're hearing the, the tongues and they're saying, what is going on here? Are these people crazy? And then they see it carried through to that interpretation where it becomes prophecy. And they are starting to realize that these people are knowing things that they couldn't possibly know with human understanding. And that miracle becomes complete. And they're saying, whoa, God is really among you. Something amazing is happening here. That's why the two work so well together. As we move on, I want to circle back to this. Um, in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, I know we just read that, but it says, I will pray in my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. You're taking it from that tongues to something that's intelligible, something that you can respond to. I will sing with my spirit. That's praising with your spirit but you're also going to sing with your understanding so that you can learn from it, you can grow from it, your relationship with Christ grows, grows deeper. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, it says, For this meet reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. That is where you are. You're practicing giving up your free will and a lot, not, I'm not, I shouldn't say it that way. You're practicing submitting to the Holy Spirit and letting yourself lose control with those guttural under, um, the guttural groanings and the things that don't make sense. And then you're praying for that interpretation and those visions, dreams, prophecy, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit steps in. That is how you fan into flame these gifts that come from God. It's all takes submission. You have to put yourself to the side. And part of your weakness is your pride and your, not, your unwillingness to lose control. And it starts with those guttural moanings. That's when you start losing, I don't want to say you're losing control, you're giving the control to the Holy Spirit. That's where it starts. For the Spirit of God gave us, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So when you're able to submit at that level, you are growing in power, the supernatural power that comes from the Holy Spirit. You are growing in your capacity to love because your relationship with Christ is getting stronger, and you are growing in self-discipline because you are able to have that clear communication through the prophecy, vision, dreams, still small voice of the Holy Spirit, and have that self-discipline to continue to follow through in obedience. You're never going to get it right every time, but you're going to get it right more and more as you grow. Verse 8, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So he's saying, join me in the fact that, yeah, this life is hard, but what a glorious thing it is that we can glorify Christ and serve him. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of our per own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That was only one sentence, but there is a whole lot there. Worse, he saved us, he called us to that holy life, and it's not by anything that we did or earned. It's because of his grace. And that grace was there at the beginning of the time. And when you read about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they had plenty of grace. And that grace has been completely revealed now because Jesus has been here. He died on that cross. He rose from the dead. And he paid that price for our sins so we can have this kind of a relationship with God. Without it, we're lost. We're not going to have any fellowship with God. And all of this would be a mute point. So it's important that we keep in mind that this, this praying in the Spirit um, leads to the prophecy, visions, dreams, hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. But it's all about building your relationship with Jesus Christ. It all will point you straight back to Jesus. And the deeper your relationship with Christ is, the more miraculous the way you're going to be able to serve him will be. You'll be blown away at the things he does. When I think about what's going on with the walk and how much it's blown up, there's no way it's my credit. 
It's all because I'm giving in. I am submitting to what the guidance of the Holy Spirit is telling me to do. And when he tells me to do something, I do it. And it's just that simple. The last verse I have is 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7. 5, 6, 7, and 8. 7 is the verse that inspired the walk. And I use this because... It, it takes us straight back to the way that we need to be living every single moment of our life. Therefore, we are always confident. Why are you confident? You're confident because you're not doing it on your own strength. You're confident because you're doing it through the strength of the Holy Spirit. That's where your confidence lies. You know you'll mess it up. I know I'll mess it up. But when I do it through the Holy Spirit, it comes together beautifully. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So we are not in heaven praising the Lord. However, we get to verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We live in that faith. We live in that spiritual realm, and we act on those visions, those dreams, the prophecy, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, because it allows us to glorify Christ and tell others about Christ with confidence. Verse eight, we are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That confidence has to come from the Holy Spirit. If it's coming from you, you're gonna run out. It's not a steady supply. So as you go into your prayer closet today, check out these verses. Um, I'm gonna swing through them really quick so you can jot them down and read them on your own. Romans 8, 26 to 27, Ephesians 6, 18, Jude 17 through 23, Galatians 5, 13 to 17, Acts 2 all the way through verse 12, Romans 4, 2, 1 Corinthians 14, the whole chapter, and 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Check those are out and really pray over it. Are you there? Are you at the point where you're praying in the Spirit? Because when you're at the point when you're praying in the Spirit, you're in that sweet spot where it's about to completely, the communication between you and God is about to completely break wide open. If you need any help or any guidance with this, please feel free to send me a message. I'll be glad to encourage and help you um, as you pursue your relationship with Christ. Have a wonderful day. God bless. And oh, we've got to pray. I'm sorry, I almost forgot. Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you for the fact that when we do pray in the spirit, it opens up all those barriers to the communication. It gets us focused on you. Those moans and those guttural sounds and the, the words that are unintelligible just open up that entire avenue of communication between us so that we can move into those visions, those dreams, the prophecy, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, and we can act with confidence as we serve you. Help us to keep those God goggles on and keep being aware of that open communication between us and the Holy Spirit as we serve you and go through our week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless and keep walking the walk.